Hello. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Make sure my laptop's not gonna fall off here. Um, hmm. Okay, so my name is Casper. Um, I'm an electronic <laughs> engineer and uh, work in embedded systems. But my talk's going to be about uh, beginner electronics, really. Uh, I've got there's a link to the slides up there if you want to access them on your own device. Um, so the way electronics are designed generally is using CAD software. There's a few free software. CAD or EDA programs are sometimes called, uh, pictured here is KiCad, and generally you w the way it works is, um, I don't know if I have a pointer, mm, maybe not. Uh, you have your schematic entry, so that's what's up on the left there, where you define all the connections of your components in a kind of more abstract sense, and then you move over to uh, a layout tool where you then have actual uh, kind of physical models of the components and where you then uh, route those connections in a on, on that physical model to pr produce your PCB design. Um, and people do this and they share their designs freely. Uh, I do this kind of informal survey of projects that are out there um, and Normally, I, I give this, I give this, I give these kinds of talks at FOSDEM, so I do it in February normally, um, and I did it again the other day. Um, somehow the projects went down the other day. I don't know, <laughs> so they don't. Uh, the projects on GitHub they, that kind of doesn't support my thesis anymore. But I think maybe GitHub changed something about the way they index the projects, or maybe it was because Microsoft acquired GitHub. I don't know, um, <laughs> uh, but. Generally, still, I think that there's more and more projects being put up. It is kind of a growing thing. Uh, obviously, the, the older projects don't really go away, so there's more and more of open hardware that you can make use of. So this talk is really about um, making use of all this open source hardware that's out there. The projects shared on Oshpark, that's a popular PCB service, and they have a kind of project sharing bit in there where people just upload their designs. And there's other ways people share projects. Obviously, there's Hackaday.io is quite popular, and there's people publish on their own blogs. Anyway, so it's really growing, and there's a lot to make use of. So we're going to just talk about how, if you wanted to make use of an open hardware project, here's what you need to know, like the shortcut method to build an open, open source hardware electronics project. And my image is missing. Interesting. Uh, I think that's okay though. I'll just talk about this. Um, so, really, electronics is all about connections. Like, like I said in the CAN program, you define your connections, then you route your connections, and all um, to simplify electronics to its basics is you're trying to just connect these things up in a way that m is going to make them do something. So, uh, the solderless breadboard is a really good method for you to do that. It has internal connections, like the trap for beginner is just to remember where those connections are, and it kind of helps to have this visual of, a, of what, the, what the inside is like and where the connections are being made. So uh, down the side there, and then each individual row, like row on each side is connected, and then as long as you know that, you can plug uh, electronic components in and uh, connect them to each other. Uh, it's a little bit... It's definitely a good hands-on way to just get started and, and, and do electronics. Uh, it's a little less, it's not as permanent as you want really often, like the connection, whoop. Hello? Lost my mic. Can you still hear me? 
Oh yes, all right. <laughs> no shit. Um, uh, so uh, you might want to uh, make uh, the uh, this more permanent. So you'd you'd uh, you, you could use something like uh, what's called Proto or Vero or Stripboard. These are various incarnations of uh, copper clad board that have connections defined on them that you can see and you can then make solder connections to connect everything up. Um, but often that can be very tedious as well. So what people do uh, is print it printed circuit boards and you can do this at home. Uh, you need, uh, you, you can buy a copper clad board and you print on it through some, through different methods. Um, my, my favorite is through a lithography process where you have a transparency and you have a copper clad board with a, a, um, a, a light sensitive layer and you expose that under UV light and uh, that way your, your circuit, your connections are printed onto that board and then you use an, uh, an acid uh, to remove copper everywhere where you haven't printed onto basically. So that's quite a neat process. Um, but when you look at uh, design files online that you find, you'll find a lot more layers. Uh, and we're gonna just go through what all those different layers are and what they're for. Um, yeah, so generally the files you're looking for that define the PCB design are the, um, oh, I have a mouse, um, uh, Gerber files. So um, those are the files that you send to a PCB manufacturer to have your board made. Th um, you kind of export from your CAD program to Gerber files, and they have all these different layers that you can see here. Um, so the substrate, the kind of base layer of everything is normally FR4, it's a fiberglass material. You can get different substrates, but FR4 is by far the most common, and people only really switch to uh, uh, other substrates if they need some speciality things like better heat dissipation or some certain radio frequency properties. Generally, they will be uh, 1.6 millimeter. That's what probably the normal thickness. Uh, you used to have to pay a lot more to get thinner ones these days. It's also quite cheap to get thinner uh, substrate. It just saves on weight and uh, you lose some rigidity though, obviously. Uh, so generally, you, you like as I mentioned before, you buy these with uh, copper clad. So there's just a, this is FR4 with, a, with copper layers on both sides. And you can use that for home etching. Uh, so copper obviously is a conductive material that, that you need <laughs> to make uh, electrical connections. So uh, we've already talked about etching, not sure when that's there again, but Maybe just a call back to that. Um, so the the layer above the copper is the mask, and that's actually what gives printed circuit boards their, c the, their different colors. So you can get quite a lot of variety in different colors. Uh, but if you look at closely at the mask, you can see there is copper under here. So that's made this orange much brighter and there's no copper here, so you can kind of see it's orange all over, but underneath the mask is copper. And the reason for the mask is it helps you solder, really. So when you have components on there and it's unmasked here, so the, the, kind of the copper is coming through and uh, it, it, like it stops the solder going anywhere where you don't want it to go. That's what's what it's for. The the colors are just a bonus. Um, so then, I on top of the mask layer, you have a silk screen layer. So you can use that to. It's generally for people uh, to indicate any kind of anything you want uh, to let people know. So um, like you you'd have your identification of components and any other kind of messages that you want to put on there. The the drilling process uh, you can you basically you have a lot of different sizes of drills. 
And generally, the drills inside, they then go through an electroplating process so they can conduct through the board to the different, to the other side, to the other layers. Um, so this is really the industrial PCB manufacturing process. Uh, you still have this kind of, you have this etching process that you can do at, at home as well, but you have all these extra, st extra steps to go through to build up multiple layers and connect them to each other and um, uh, allowing for more complex designs and more robust electronics. Uh, this has become really cheap over the last 10 years, so there's a lot of different services. I wouldn't be able to fit them all on a slide, and you can easily order, you know, you can order a PCB depending on the size, maybe for the price of a, uh, a takeaway meal or something. Um, so I guess that bit makes open source hardware electronics even more interesting because it's become really accessible to the average person. Uh, so the other part of it, of course, is the, the parts that you need to go on your printed circuit board. Um, so we're gonna just going to talk about that a bit. Really, what you're looking for is a bill of materials, uh, BOM for short, where the designer has specified all the parts, and hopefully they've gone s as far as to say what part numbers they need, uh, what, what exact part numbers and manufacturer uh, they are. And uh, so if you're looking at an open source hardware project, that's the file you look, you're trying to find to get all the details of all the parts that you need to buy. Um, this can be a little bit of a tedious process. Uh, so I actually run an open source project, an open source platform where I combine um, the, uh, the, the printed circuit board design together with a standard way to define the parts list. And then I try and automate that process of buying the parts. So make to make this, uh, this process of getting the parts together for an open source hardware project even more practical. And we've got an um, image missing, unfortunately. I might just, um, sorry. There we go, yes. Okay. Um, so we're just going to go through all the different components. If you've never, s if you if you don't know anything about electronics, and um, we're, we're not going to talk too much about the theory of electronics, but just go through what these components look like, so you can identify them. Um, uh, these are resistors. You get them in kind of for all components. You kind of get these through-hole components with legs on them. So you go through these, then go through the board, and uh, you get surface mount components, which are much smaller. I don't know why I've chose such a huge image, but this is actually a really tiny component that sits on top of your PCB when you solder it and you don't, it doesn't go through. Uh, so resistors come in these, generally that's what they look like, either these bigger components with legs on them and kind of colored marks or little tiny uh, black rectangles with numbers on them. And so the numbers, here the colors and the numbers, they indicate the values of these resistors, not part numbers or anything. Capacitors, they hold charge, that's what they're for. Again, they come, they range from really big, uh, kind of whopping uh, electrolytic capacitors to tiny ceramic surface mount components um, and, and, and everything in between. Again, through hole and surface mount. Inductors, like coils of wire around Magnetic cores often have interesting electrical properties, and again, they come in huge kind of things that you can actually wind yourself to tiny little uh, surface mount versions that have been already be already been wound for you, and everything in between. Diodes, well of which are favorites of obviously the LEDs, light emitting diodes. Uh, again, they come in different shapes. I don't know. I haven't got any surface mount. One's pictured here, but they come in tiny little surface mount packages as well. But uh, they can look 
uh, quite pretty, and often you can look inside of them to see, like, really see how they work. Um, transistors, normally uh, kind of three-pin packages, uh, black packages, often they will have the, the part numbers on them printed rather than any values or anything. Um, again, range from, range from smaller, smaller parts to, again, through-hole components. And with integrated circuits, these are generally like rectangles or square components with a lot of, lot of different pins. And integrated circuits obviously can be anything from chips that you program to more complex analog stuff that, that, uh, that does something for you or even uh, sensors uh, for CMOS kind of. So, you're so we're just going to talk about going from this printed circuit board, assuming you've ordered your printed circuit board and you have the parts all available. Uh, and now you we're going to just talk about the soldering process of actually putting the components on. Uh, what you want to do really is hold down your circuit board because uh, if you don't hold it down while you're trying to work on it, it's just going to keep moving as you're trying to work on it. So that's really annoying and something we you learn pretty quickly early on. The cheapest solution to this, just tack it down with some blue tack. Or if you want to get uh, more advanced, you can get all kinds of tools that will hold your circuit board in place for you. Um, uh, the, the, problem w the problem with the blue tech, it does work well, but it, it will actually melt and burn, so it's not the best solution, but it often is the easiest. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we could just, uh, we I mentioned briefly, there's all these through-hole components, so on through-hole, you kind of place the leg through the PCB, and then through careful application of heat, you melt solder wire that you put on. The technique to soldering really is to heat up the the pad and the pin together and then apply solder to that. So it's all about heat transfer and not about getting as much solder as possible on there, but just melting that little bit of solder that you're putting on there. Um, you can see this person hasn't actually tacked their project down, but you can see it already slightly moving as they're trying to solder it, and that could get really annoying. But they've managed anyway, so that goes against what I just said. <laughs> anyway, uh, soldering, uh, like I just said, there's just there's some basic tips. It's all about heat transfer. So you want, uh, you want well, there's, there's th th these are electronics irons. These, these uh, gun-type irons are normally for plumbing, so you don't want that. You want something with, uh, with enough power if you're getting if you're getting more advanced, you could get something with temperature control, but you want a nice stand for it because these uh, th these cheapo stands will result in you getting burned. Really, I mean, you're gonna get burned yourself anyway, but this is gonna speed that process up. For you. Um, generally, even though even if you're working with fine components, you want a a, a, a chisel tip because it's really the most important bit is trying to get heat into the comp the pad and the and the part. So the chisel tip really helps with conducting as much heat as possible. So even if you're working on really fine stuff, oftentimes the chisel tip is the most versatile tip, and it'll do most of what you do want to do as a beginner. Uh, and the p the, the the pointed tip is normally the wrong choice. Um, uh yeah so the soldering process heat the pad up heat the heat the parts up add solder to the joint hold it down for a few seconds and let it cool down and as you do this more and more you'll be able to spot when your so, so uh, soldering hasn't worked out quite like you want uh this is what it's supposed to look like that's too much not enough this is a cold joint so it's actually you've just heated up your pin uh, your pin here and all the solders on the pin is probably not properly connected to the pad at the bottom. Uh, you can always burn stuff and then things will go black and fall off. And uh, you want to avoid these kinds of shorts or bridges between pins, obviously, unless it's part of your design. Um, 
Zolder, just uh, I would recommend as a beginner try and use leaded Zolder, even though if you wanted to make a product and sell it, you wouldn't be allowed to use that. Uh, just wash your hands. Don't try not to breathe in, <laughs> in any of the fumes generally. Uh, Flux is your friend. So Flux it helps solder flow and attach to the bits that you want to attach to. So you can get this in a pen form. And it's good practice to just use that pen on all the, all the, the bits that you want to solder before you solder. Often solder will come with Flux internally as well. So you have this resin core in here. And that's probably a good idea for most work. Uh, you can also get it in a paste form. So that's mainly if you want to try and do surface mount soldering. Uh, you can you apply the paste and heat it up, not using an iron generally. Um, but we'll talk about that in a bit. I think the most important tip about soldering is really try and relax, be peaceful, try and get comfortable, and don't don't stress out about it, and just take your time. And I think that's the most important thing I learned when I was when I was starting out is to get into a comfortable position and that way you can do the work without shaking or uh, uh, any other kind of interference and um, it's a lot more it's a lot more fun that way anyway if you're just relaxed about it um, yeah so we've t I've talked about this several times already surface mount technologies when the components sit on top and they don't go, the legs of the components don't go through your board. And uh, there's w various ways to do that. You can actually see here th in this little animation, they are using solder paste and an iron, which I just said I probably wouldn't do and I've never done, but it seems to work for them. Generally, the surface tension of the solder helps you out a lot. So if you're just careful about not adding too much solder and carefully applying heat, then it will kind of sort itself out. Um, so don't be afraid of surface mount. It's all about really, you can get quite large surface mount components. Uh, maybe um, the, the tricky thing really is size. So I can't, for instance, I can't, I'm still quite young. I can still solder 0603 components. Oh, sorry, the, yeah, the um, I generally use the Imperial codes here. That's what I'm used to. That's what most people are used to. But it's extra confusing because the metric codes also have the same numbers. It's, it's great. Um, um, but 0603 Imperial is generally what I can still sort of by hand uh, and with with the naked eye. And I, do I don't really bother with anything smaller than that. And with integrated circuits as well, these kinds of pitches, these kinds of components, I don't want to really hand solder these with an iron. It's kind of impossible. Uh, but there's other methods, so you can actually use uh, an oven and solder paste. You apply solder paste to the board before, put your chip on, and heat it up through. Uh, you want to check that it doesn't get too hot and kind of have this uh, slow, slow rise in heat, and then uh, you want to cool it down as quickly as possible normally uh, after that. Uh, so you can kind of hack a toaster oven to do this. There's loads of projects out there that help you use an oven uh, for this kind of soldering. And uh, like your local hack space probably has a hacked one, or you can make one yourself. Um, so uh, yeah, I would encourage you to try and do that. I'm just going to, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Uh, I don't have a clock anywhere. Anyway, um, just go through some projects that you might want to make. Um, so these are actually projects that I've taken from kidspace.org that people have put up so far. Uh, this is an interesting project. It's an FPGA controller for uh, e-ink, for the kind of conventional e-ink uh, displays. So this person has spent a lot of time developing uh, uh, FPGA hardware implementation of the wave that you need to drive these e-ink displays. And they've gone to quite a, a lot of detail on what's required to do that. So uh, that's a really fun project that I've been meaning to build for a while now. But uh, I think there's a lot of interest in e-ink because it can be used for kind of low power applications because you can have your display and then power everything off and your display is still 
displaying something, which is neat for all kinds of applications, and this is definitely a fun one to look at. Uh, there's the A Arduino, that's a really kind of popular project that was put up. It's an so it's an AA battery sized Arduino clone. Um, so you can, I don't have the other picture of it. There's a better picture of it. You can actually put one side, you can use a conventional battery holder and put this battery, a battery in there, and then this, uh, put the Arduino into that case as well. So you kind of have a, a free case for your Arduino, and it's uh, ISM radio, so it can commu communicate uh, uh, to radio communications, and you can use that for all sorts of uh, sensor applications or other things where you need radio com radio communications. Uh, this is 8-bit MixSafe, so a project from a friend of mine. It's just a, it's a really kind of fun noise synthesizer with an itty tiny on it, and it's a really nice PCB design. I have a few of these, I think, with me. So if you speak to me and you would like to build this one, I have a, I can give you a PCB, and then you can use Kitspace to get the parts. Um, yeah, so if you want to learn more about this, if this seems interesting to you, I would encourage you to check out your local hack space. Uh, we have the Bristol Hackspace here in Bristol, obviously, and all over the UK there's Hackspaces, and even in Brussels, which has kind of fallen off the screen there, there's a cool Hackspace, and they win the logo competition, I think. Um, there is kitspace.org, check that out, obviously. Uh, then uh, I have made this kind of uh, awesome electronics list of resources that help you in your pursuit to get into electronics. Um, so check that out. I think that's everything. That's my talk. <laughs> I don't know what the plan is. I could take questions if there's time, but I think we're running behind schedule. Uh, I think we could take one or two there while we try and get the next speaker sorted out there. I just had a quick question. I was curious, why should you not blow on the... Uh solder after you solder a piece on. You said in your graphic, it said don't blow on it to cool Did it I? down. I don't even remember that. Oh, uh, I've never seen that. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I think the danger is if it's m if it's still uh, wet and liquid, then you you can kind of ruin your joint by blowing on it and just it'll you have. I doubt it. I really doubt it. Huh? Oh, so the quest. Uh, so the original question was what whether um why why you shouldn't do this and not blow on it. And I, uh, my best guess is that you, it would just, it could, if it's liquid, it could ruin your joint. I don't think it's anything about cooling down too quickly, to be honest. Yeah. Any other, yeah? So pointer tips, they, like if you're really, if you are doing really, really fine work, uh, then they are useful. But it's just, it's, to that point where maybe you actually shouldn't be hand soldering something. Uh, I mean, I've seen, I have seen amazing repair technicians use hand solder and use pointed tips, and they obviously know what they're doing. But these kind of these kind of shortcuts are just for beginners. Like, y so th m for most beginners, a pointed tip is not the right choice. Great. Last question over there. I am sure there is. I don't know though. I've I've wound smaller ones myself. The question is: Is there a good way to um, to to w hand wind a, an inductor? And there's m machinery for it. And there's a probably expert, lots of experts that love telling you all about it. <laughs> but I'm not one of them. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time we have there. Kay. Let's have another round of applause for our great speaker here.